again, focus on the problem. So this is Yuri uh, from Waze. And I love this quote, of, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Because then you'll truly be able to iterate no matter what by always looking at how is your customer changing? And how is the community changing? And it's all about that growth mindset because this hypothesis testing and that kind of methodology takes a lot of hits in your ego. <laughs> Trust me, I've done this at least 60 times. And one of the main things, and one of the main things that's helping both startups and current companies is understanding that you have to try things because there are no examples of how they've been done before. There's so much new, so many new tools and technology and ways of doing things that, depending how you combine them, you can do all kinds of things. So the point is, give it a try in a very small way and learn. So if you fail, you learn so that you can take the next step and learn even more. So having that growth mindset versus a fixed one, and that's why a lot of corporations now are saying, hey, we need to do something with this innovation thing, because if not, the startups are going to take over our markets. So how do we even do that? And it all starts with a perspective. Because if you say, no, this is, this is my, I'm the boss, this is my idea, this is the way that we're going to do it, that's more of a fixed mindset, because it's the right way or wrong way, versus saying, let's figure out what it is, and how it's done, and why, why do we even need this? Are we just building a resource for resource sake? Or are we actually doing something that's going to truly benefit the community? So the difference between entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship. So like I said, the approach is pretty much the same. It's all about hypothesis testing. No one truly knows exactly what they're doing. We're all figuring it out along the way. And these methodologies of lean and agile, design thinking, they're all meant to help you create a framework around hypothesis testing and to de-risk all the possibilities that can make your company fail. So an entrepreneur, you have way more freedom. You have more risk, so you don't have a whole team and departments to help you out or bail you out. Uh, and you're your own boss, which is pretty cool. But for intrapreneurship, there's a lot less risk. You're way more safeguarded uh, because there's parameters. So you say, okay, we'll go forward until this much, and this is how it's gonna go. And if it fails, well, you'll still have a job. So there's less risk with that, but there's also less freedom because you need more buy-in. You need more internal support. You need to be an internal entrepreneur by pitching your idea and justifying it. So by going to the, the hypothesis testing, you're actually building up your case to do evidence-based decision-making. And that's what all of this is. You do the hypothesis testing, so you say, we interviewed 100 people and 80% said that this was the biggest pain. Now, you're not fighting against me if you don't agree with my potential solution, you're fighting against the data. And it's your decision now to say if you want to move forward or your boss's decision. And then if they say no, great. But now you have all of the proof to back up why this would work and why it wouldn't. So I did consulting with Boeing and Publix, and that's truly when I started getting into this intrapreneurial world. Like, okay, so it's the same approach, but what's truly the difference? So that's what I noticed more than anything. It's that these tools give you the power to justify why and how you want to do this within a company that already has those resources. So, like I said, companies are struggling, truly, to figure out how to keep up and how to still keep their, their customers. And that's why there's a lot of acquisitions, there's a lot of companies going out and realizing that it's actually more expensive sometimes to hire an entire team and figure out this innovation and the new technologies and what's coming up next than just to see, okay, who already has that market? What's already working? And then we'll buy that and then integrate it. So with that speed, these frameworks and these tools and that mindset and all that become more and more imperative. If you're starting your own company or if you're an in-established company, the main uh, issue that I've seen with companies with this is that they're built to be stable. They have to pay their staff every month and they're large corporations, they have a lot of investments. So shaking something around not doesn't just mean for one department, it means for the entire company. So then what's the culture? So how are we gonna do this? 
So that's where a lot of the companies that at least I've seen or worked with are at. It's just, it's a lot of questions, but these kinds of frameworks really help out. So the main difference between a startup and entrepreneurial corp approach, you're both designed to search and identify a problem. So for the startup, you have a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. While the entrepreneurial approach, it's more of an initiative or uh, a identified problem because it could be a program, service, or hey, we need a new line of revenue. Uh, that's designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. Because whatever you do, even if it's within a company or outside, you have to sustain it somehow. That means there's resources, time, uh, money and salaries that you need to pay. So how are you going to sustain that? So the approach for entrepreneurship or intrapreneurship, pretty much the same. So how does that actually work inside of the companies? So there's the outside in approach, and these are only a couple of examples. There's so much out there. And then the inside out approach. So the outside in means we're so, our company, we're operating, but let's create an accelerator for the entire world for example, Barclays. So they're a bank and they do FinTech. So they have an accelerator that has uh, stations all around the world. And so they get startups that are trying to solve FinTech issues. So they get the best ones, they open up their network, they help these startups grow. And then they decide after watching them throughout that, that um, the whole progress, if they want to get them as customers, acquire them, or do whatever possible. Like I said before, sometimes it's cheaper to actually just see what's already working, and let's go with that. So that's more of the corporate accelerators. And just in case there's someone here that doesn't know what an accelerator is, it's a program designed to accelerate your business. And there's accelerator, accelerators at different stages, so from a napkin stage so to I uh, have a proof of concept to you're making a million, you're making five million, so there's all kinds. Um, innovation collaborations, so this is more of, I am, and I'll show you in a little bit, I am Orlando Magic and I'm collaborating with Advent Health in order to design a system between the two of us and be able to track the players better. So it's uh, the corporate so uh, innovation side with the corporate innovation side from another company coming together. Uh, innovation ecosystem, so that's you guys more than anything. So that's going into the, eco the ecosystem that you have locally and saying, what's here? What can we do? Uh, and then mergers and acquisitions. So you have a great product, we like it, we're going to now absorb it, and now that becomes a new offering that we have. So that's the outside in approach. The inside out approach. You can do it in different ways. You can hire these innovative people that know these frameworks and how to do it. You can uh, designate a department, sometimes it's called like the skunk works department or uh, the department that's trying to take the business out of business. So Pearson's, for example, has a department that literally their sole job is to put Pearson's education company out of business. So how do you start using the new technology and the features and all that? Could these solve these problems better? Could kids learn better? with some of these tools that are available to us. Uh, and then inside you can do things like hackathons, just invite anyone that has an idea out and provide the framework for it. Uh, you have internal pitch competitions or you can do more of like um, awards and things like that. So it ultimately, more than anything, it's very reliant on culture. So if you're a very traditional organization, say a large, large bank, to change that kind of culture, it's very difficult, and that's not truly in the DNA, so how do you start doing that? But if you don't have the culture internally, and then you say, this is the way that I'm gonna do it, and then you follow my lead, and I shut you down, what's the likelihood of you speaking up and saying, hey, I have an idea, or let me throw something crazy out there and see if it sticks? So culture and incentives uh, and an actual facilitation of that system is critical. And then uh, last example I wanted to uh, share with you is Innovation Lab. So the Orlando Magic locally, as well as Advent Health, and even I believe is it PNC Bank, have Innovation Labs inside of them that any department that has a problem or wants to figure out how to do something more efficient, they'll go to the Innovation Lab, and then they have a team there of support. And which is fantastic. It's like, hey, I have this problem, or we have to figure this out. 
how should we go about it? And then you go through these lean methodologies, agile development, sprints, and all of that. So this is how the Orlando Magic does it. So I mentioned innovation collaborators, innovation ecosystem, so matching up with you guys, and then the lab internally to actually work things through. So that's what I learned in, in that portion of my life with i and doing the consulting with Boeing and Publix and realizing we're all using the same approaches. And these are skill sets that are here to stay. So from there, we entered a bit into a lull because we needed to renew the grant from the National Science Foundation. So we're doing the reporting, all the fun stuff. Um, and so during that time, I realized that Grow Florida is uh, partly sponsored by UCF. And I had the opportunity to work with them for about nine months or so. And Grow Florida, what they do and what I learned with them was how to scale second stage companies. So companies that are earning about $750,000 a year plus. And so this is a resource that you guys can use once you get to this stage. They provide a lot of grants. Uh, all of these services are for paid, but they provide a lot of grants that can cover 100% to 80% of the actual cost. So pretty much it's strategic research and programming for businesses. So once you figure out, okay, I have this customer base, I know how this is working, all of that's fine and dandy. How do I actually grow and scale to the next level? Because the skill sets and what brought you to point A doesn't necessarily mean it's going to bring you to point B. So at that point in time, uh, there's the research program that helps you analyze all your potential customers, where you could go, uh, strategies that you need to develop, things that may be missing inside of your company. It's a truly fantastic thing. CEO roundtables, it's very lonely at the top. You, don't, you can't really talk to your employees about another problem you're having with another employee. So the roundtables really help to share with other CEOs what is actually happening and what's going on and how could I actually address this. So that, along with mentorship, I think are one of the most essential things to have for a successful business. And that could be your advisors or board of directors, but someone you can go to and say, hey, this is going on, what do I do? What have you done, or could you help me out with this? Because we're not, we don't know everything. So, so yeah, uh, and they have the Florida companies to watch where they honor the 50 fastest growing companies in Florida. So it's a pretty cool and very uh, effective organization. So they have workshops and then they have a program specifically for manufacturing as well. And so I finished that and saw an opportunity to join a startup. So I was one of five people within the startup uh, called Powered by Nexus. Who's, who knows Nexus? Couple. <laughs> well, Nexus is no more because we merged. So, <laughs> makes sense. Uh, so Nexus helped. So from there, I wanted to figure out, okay, so I know now how companies can use methodologies to figure out what kind of model works. Then once they get to a certain stage, this is the way that they can grow. So where's the financing in all this? Who has access to this financing? Because even though you have the proof of concept, you need to fund it somehow and some upfront money in order to either build the thing or do the marketing or hire people, whatever that may be. So this startup helped connect accredited individuals and angel investors to startups throughout the state of Florida, the entire state. So we were founded in 2013 and merged in 2018. So in 2013, um, so well, throughout the lifetime, we invested $20.1 million into 67 companies. I'm really proud of, out of a team of five people uh, that we were truly able to do that. So what I learned at Nexus was investors want to see this. They want to understand that you have these customers, that there, are, there is going to be a return on investment. Something else that I learned, you meet one angel investor, you met one angel investor. <laughs> because it's more of their, their personal money that they're trying to see, uh, you know, could I invest in this very risky business because they haven't actually made it all the way, but I'm very interested in fintech, or I'm very interested in social businesses, and I'm very interested in building a blank. So you, 
I have to understand what kind of angel investor do you want to go after? And is it the right time? Because they're going to take equity. So could you build it on your own and raise the value of your company so that you have more power to say, no, I'm not going to take this, or yes, I will take this, and more options with that, and more access to, to their capital. And pretty much these are the levels of readiness, meaning should you even start looking at angel investing? And more than anything is, is there a proof of concept? Do you have any kind of traction? And something that I've noticed, the companies that have traction and can prove people want this, it's a true pain and there's a way to make money, get money. If it's still at the concept stage and you're trying to get your first customer or your first pilot, that's not gonna work because you still have a lot to learn after your first pilot. So, reduce risk, and that's what they're looking for. Put yourselves in their shoes and say, okay, if I had $25,000 to play with, and I can divvy that up in one year, who would you give that money to? And more than anything, what the investor's investing is in the team. Who will execute this? Do I trust them to execute? Do they know what they're doing? Can they say, hey, we messed up, and now we're going to learn and move forward? Because that's the whole point of having that growth mindset. So 500 Startups is a world-renowned accelerator that uh, put this together, which I think is really helpful uh, for, for anybody to, to kind of understand uh, at what point should you start looking at accelerators or how things should work. So you have the concept first, say that, okay, you've identified what the problem is, you're going through uh, de-risking your business. You create a functional prototype. You are at the early stage of customer usage because people do have a problem and they do are willing to pay for it. So there, that's what, where they come in. Um, but then that, now you need to scale. So from the product size of saying, okay, does this actually solve the problem to what's the market? So is there actually a larger market to scale or are you just gonna become a lifestyle business? And then from there, if there is a lot of potential for growth, that's when you can really think about the exits and all of that, and then where the Googles will look at you, because now you have massive reach. And something else that I personally realized is that concepts and everything that, that I've been talking about, you can do it for social ventures exactly the same way. You just have to have that vision and that purpose. So this slide is just meant to show you uh, from the seed stage, usually what uh, what startups use for funding at each of those stages. So at an early stage, you have the three Fs, friends, families, and fools. So you, you kind of exploit that, and obviously yourself. You try to get through that, and then you're, okay, you get that proof of concept, you're officially a company, you're starting it out, and that's where you get to that angel groups, angel investors, uh, start kind of going into that. And then when you're at early growth and you're saying, okay, let's actually see if we can get into that mass market. Not just the early adopters and the people are really geeky and are really excited and they're part of your community, but everybody else. And that's usually where the bulk of your customers will come and that's the value of death. Because you get so excited and it's so promising because everybody around you is saying that, oh, it's great, I love it, all these things. But then when you get outside of that bubble or outside of those people that have that interest, do you have enough people that care enough or value it enough to actually pursue it forward? And then you get VCs and funds and all of that afterwards. And obviously underneath here, it's you can go through debt, you can go through grants and all that kind of government, both financial and then government aid. In Orlando, we have a lot of organizations that do funding. So I just want to break that misconception of like there's no money in Orlando. There is a lot of money in Orlando. You know how many people move here to retire? They have a lot of money. <laughs> so take advantage of it. But they want to see a proof that you're solving a problem and that people care enough to buy it and that you have enough people that care to grow that business. So yeah, so these are some loans. These are, this is not all of them. <laughs> this is just some of them. There's a huge list. And so get yourself known. It's, it's really possible to do it here. 
Just show that this, there's traction. But, oh yeah, one more thing. Um, show there's traction. This is not Silicon Valley. Uh, they will not invest in like a Twitter kind of deal that still hasn't made money. So if you want that, then go to California. <laughs> there is still a lot of money here. <laughs> but uh, at least from my perspective and the, what I know about Orlando, uh, there aren't a lot of investors that are willing to invest in those kinds of businesses. So, all right, so I went to Nexus, uh, the merger came about, and I had the choice to say, okay, I can stay and go with Florida Funders, which is a statewide network of angel investors that they still exist, so feel free to uh, log on to their website and check them out. Uh, so I went back to you know, where I initially started with international economic development and how do we create platforms to empower everybody. So I have an imperative uh, that created while I was in DC before coming to Orlando, because again, I wasn't quite sure how I was going to do this. And so my imperative is to help communities organically grow and reinvest in themselves in order to build local wealth, allowing for people to have the opportunity to have a choice. So with that train of thought and saying, okay, I've learned all of these things, I've had some wonderful experiences, have met incredible people in the community. There's so much going on in Orlando. How am I actually matching these worlds? So while at Nexus, I started developing my own organization or program, wasn't sure what it was gonna morph into. So I started my own business model campus. And I did over 150 informational interviews to understand how was this information of lean methodologies and agile and that kind of education being dispersed outside of the university bubble that I was in and outside of like the major fortune 500 corporations that have all the resources in the world so there wasn't a lot at least in Orlando at that point in time so I was like okay let's create a program let's do something to actually distribute this information but I first need to figure out what the pain point is do people actually want this are they willing to pay for it so I can grow it and continue doing it? Or maybe I can find a partner. So I got accepted to the Rally Social Accelerator, which is a local social venture accelerator. Great accelerator. You guys are thinking of uh, a business that has more of a social, socioeconomic, environmental focus. Highly suggested. Uh, so at Rally, I realized, you know, the way that I want to actually go about this program is to integrate businesses from the main city as well as in distressed community to help build social capital. Because we're all here to build businesses, to grow economic development, to pay people a decent salary and grow our economy and make our own world a better place at least. But how can you do that if you don't have the access to customers that have higher net worth? How do you do that when you don't know anybody or, or you don't you just don't have that connection. It's really hard. And so networks and connections are an imperative part of making anything successful. So start looking at the data. And in two this is Orlando, you have huge disparity between poverty. It's like, okay, so we have a lot of wealth here. We have a lot of resources. We have all of these things, but this is still true. And this is not just true for Orlando, this is true for the United States and around the world. You pass one street over and it's a completely different story. So how do we start including people and actually merging these worlds instead of them being so separate and improving some of these numbers? Because what I have learned from the NGO and the nonprofit world and all of that that I did is that what people want is to be self-empowered, not to be empowered by someone else, because that can't happen. You can only empower yourself. They wanted a platform to jump off of. They wanted a job so that they can go to their families and say, I bought you this gift. I did this. I'm taking care of my family and my community, and now I'm able to give back. And so with that mindset and understanding that what people truly want is jobs and a decent paying job. So you can enjoy your life and contribute the way that you would like. I realize that it isn't a playing league, uh, equal playing field. Because we're all born with different opportunities and different standards. So I started looking at the data regarding women and men and investments and who gets the opportunities. And what this tells me is that 
the best ideas and the best concepts are not bubbling up. That's what that tells me. Because why are why is it is the disparity so large between the men and the women founders? Where I mean, I've seen incredible amounts of women pitch and all that, and what I realized is that because majority of investors are men in Florida, ninety four percent of angel investors are men. Sometimes they just can't connect to the product. They don't quite understand the market, and that's normal. I mean, if I didn't understand something like shaving company. I'm not going to invest in it, period. <laughs> I don't feel comfortable. It's too much risk. I don't know what questions to ask. And I saw that happening over and over again. So I'm like, okay, so if this is a fact, what can we do about it? How do we even start? So understanding what the situation is so that you can address it. And this is something that, uh, so the VP of research at the Urban Economic Partnership put this together which I love because I don't know if you guys have seen this floating around social media, what 10 things that it takes to just make it. So being on time, making an effort, high energy, positive attitude, doing all these things. Yes, true, does not take talent or any specific skill sets or any kind of education per se. It's more of the attitude and how you present yourself. But you really can't achieve those without reliable transportation, without having that purpose, without having good sleep, the opportunities, the capacity to give, the confidence that you have, if everyone in your life has told you that's not your world, and you don't have any examples around you or people that look like you of what you would like to do, say, in a, as a software developer, chances are, as human beings, we're going to shy away from that opportunity. So we don't connect with that. And we don't feel invited. So, put it up. Point that out. So, hiring. And going back to the methodologies and going back to that education that really allows you to check out what are the resources around me and how do I de-risk the idea that I have to pursue it and to, to grow it, to make money, to be able to uh, give people a decent wage and salary versus like a, some nonprofits and NGOs that I saw that had one staff member almost at the poverty line and 12 unpaid interns. <laughs> like that's not really economic development, it's just putting a band-aid on something. Because then if that funding goes away, everything goes away. So how do we start, if this is the hiring part of things, more that intrapreneurship mindset versus, or even starting your own company, these skills that are this year that companies are looking for, this is from LinkedIn, how can we achieve that? And so what I found out from the community is that this information wasn't getting out, period. So, I started shopping around and saying, if I want to create something that merges different aspects of our community and teach something like this at a massive scale, at that point in time, I realized I personally do not 